Today, you know, I'm going to do my, my talk about the, uh, the state of Linux. And uh, I got to tell you, I've been doing this job for almost 10 years. And one of the hardest parts of my job is every year coming up with a new way to tell everyone that Linux is great. I mean, who doesn't like the Linux? Uh, but what's been interesting lately this year is I've been getting a lot of companies that are both in technology and in adjacent industries, pharmaceuticals and others, calling up the Linux Foundation, and I'm thinking that they want to talk about Linux. But it's not just Linux that they want to talk about. They want to talk about how all of you do what you do so well, how collaborative development works, and why it's important. Because I think everybody now gets that open source is important, and open source <coughs> is essential to compete. You know, I like to think uh, VMworld is going on right now up in uh, San Francisco, and I'd like to think that while the suits are up there talking about product roadmaps and marketing, the geeks are down here actually building the next generation cloud. And, exactly. <laughs> and what I, I wanted to talk about today is why, sort of answer the question that I get a lot, which is why is it important for business to master open source? Why has Linux and open source gone beyond you know, something that I have to evangelize and talk about how great it is to this sort of essential part of computing. And the question I get is, again, specifically how do we do it? How does my organization become adept at open source? Not just consume the software, but really masters getting the most out of this multi-billion dollar R&D collaboration that we call Linux the hundreds of open source projects that all of you participate in. And my answer to these folks, who sometimes want to convince their management that they need to do more in open source or they need to get better at it, is to explain to them to first understand the idea that software is the future of the IT industry. And are there hardware people in the crowd today? Sorry, hardware is good too, okay? <laughs> and hardware is important to enable this great software. Uh, but no, hardware is important. But what I mean by software is the future of IT is that increasingly, the value that consumers of technology, whether it's on the consumer electronics side or whether it's in enterprise, the value that they get increasingly comes from the software that they get. And let me give you a quick example of what I mean by that. Can anybody tell me which of these phones are which? Anybody? I know that there's somebody out there because this is a geeky crowd and uh, I've been called out on this before. But you get my point. It's really hard to tell the difference between these devices until you do one thing, until you actually turn them on. When you turn them on, you can see that these are very different devices because it's the software that makes them different. Despite what a San Jose jury might think, <laughs> the software really does make these devices unique. And that's where people get the value from these devices. And it's not just mobile devices, it's all form of televisions and appliances and consumer devices, and also, on the enterprise side, as we move towards everything being a service, whether it's software as a service, accessing your CRM system through a web browser, whether it's infrastructure as a service, spinning up virtual machines on one of the many clouds that are out there today, or platform as a service, building applications in the cloud with tools that are meant to build cloud applications from the ground up. Enterprise software is moving towards a services model as well, where software is defining what that future will look like. This virtualized data center, that all puts software at the forefront of the technology industry. And if you are going to master software, 
you must master open source. This is the critical thing for organizations to understand, is that the days of just creating software in a room with some of the best engineers and keeping it secret and then unleashing it in binary format to the world are over. You just can't do it anymore and actually compete. And really, if you think about it, the most successful technology companies in the world are now masters of using and contributing to open source communities. But I can talk about the usual suspects in open source, companies that are really what we all think of as true masters of participating in these communities and using open source software to create wonderful products and services. Google, IBM, Intel, I mean, I think we all, anybody who's a member of the Linux Foundation, uh, I think all of these companies demonstrate that they're really good at open source. But I, I wanted to talk about something different today. I wanted to talk about some companies that you might not think are that great at open source, or that you might not think are using as much open source as they actually are. But I want to demonstrate that even companies who don't have this reputation for being big open source companies, even they, and for companies that have long competed with Linux or other open source projects, even these companies today acknowledge that if they're going to compete, they have to participate in open source development in order to leverage this massive, massive new research and development idea that is what you all are building. Let's look at a couple of them. First, Microsoft. Microsoft is supporting Linux in their cloud. You know, not because they want all of their customers to spin up Linux VMs in their cloud, but because their customers are demanding it. They are releasing code under open source licenses. It wasn't too long ago where they were calling open source licenses communism. And they're a top contributor to the Linux kernel project. They, even some of the most stalwart companies when it comes to closed software, <laughs> realize they have to participate in open source communities. VMware is hopping on the bandwagon as well. VMware just acquired a company, they spent a billion dollars uh, acquiring Nacera. Nacera produces some of the key technology in the OpenStack project. In fact, VMware submitted an application to join OpenStack this week. And if you ask them what it means, you can see here that the CTO of Nacera replied that the acquisition is part of a strategy for VMware to move towards open source, towards open standards, not away from it. So you can see these companies are all understanding that open source is critical to their future success. And you know, when I talk about this and how important open source is and how you can't be successful without using open source and how nobody makes anything these days without open source and succeeds in the market. The one criticism that I get from everyone, the counter example that I traditionally get is Apple. People say, Apple, you know, Apple is one of the most closed companies in the world from the silicon all the way up to the software. Everything is closed, everything is locked down. But you know what, even Apple, uses a lot of open source software. And there's a simple way to understand this. Let me demonstrate it. Does anybody in the room here have an iPhone? OK. Uh, if you go into the general about and legal notices section of your iPhone, and you scroll down, you might be surprised to see the GPL inside of your iPhone. We'd see some names of some people who are good friends. Ted Cho, first North American kernel developer. Is Ted around here somewhere? All right, I saw Ted last night. I wasn't sure if he was going to make it. But, uh, you know, here, Ted, he, he's in every single iPhone that's out there. You see stuff that comes out of the SUSE Linux project. You, know, you see the word Linux inside of an iPhone. The fact is that there is lots and lots and lots of open source software in every device that Apple creates. 
they get how to leverage this very, very large investment to make products and services. And what I found even more interesting is Apple even went beyond that. And let me show you what I mean. This is a projection of how much cash Apple is going to have by the end of next year. It really goes pretty far up there. It's a couple hundred billion dollars in cash. That's enough money to buy HP, Intel, and Dell combined and still have money left over. It's a lot of money. But here's the interesting part. How does Apple spend their cash? They don't traditionally do a lot of M&A activity. But one of the things they did not too long ago was they went out and used some of that cash to purchase an open source project. Cups. Does everybody know what Cups is? Anyone? Right? There's a Cups guy back there. <laughs> yes. Uh, Cups is the printing subsystem that's used in the Linux desktop. It's used in every iPad and, uh, and all of Apple's products for printing. And Apple felt that it was so important that they used some of that cash to go out and purchase the project. They purchased the copyright from the maintainer, Michael Sweet. Michael Sweet's a, an employee at Apple. And they continue to work on the project in the public under a GPL <laughs> license. But they felt that it was that important to them that they went out and did this. My point being that the world has really full scale moved in this direction. That even companies you think of as closed understand they have to participate in open source to compete. And this is how the cloud will be built. From now on, and what we're seeing is that every time there's an inflection point in technology, whether it's the move to mobile devices, which was advanced incredibly by the availability of Linux, the ability of organizations to take it and build things like Android, and build things like mobile clouds, build new interesting tablets, build new interesting consumer electronic devices. Every time there's a shift, Linux and open source are at the forefront. And the cloud is a shift right now, and the cloud is going to be built by people who are working on open source. And smart organizations need to understand that you don't need to compete with open source movements, that the best organizations leverage this collective R&D and add value on top of that at increasingly higher levels in order to be the most competitive. They set that value bar increasingly high, and that is good for innovation. That makes companies more competitive. That makes products more effective for consumers with technology. And really, all of that infrastructure and how it's being built, how the future of the cloud is happening, is broadly represented by the people here this week. Whether you're working on Zen, Chef, Puppet, or Over, or KVM, you name it. All of you here this week are the ones who are building the future of the cloud. And you know, I talked to somebody about this and about the kind of event that we were having. And you know, whether you're a venture capitalist who wants to figure out what the next big investment opportunity is, whether you're a product manager who wants to understand what the hot open source projects are, and how you can leverage them to make incredible products and services, this is the place you want to be. You want to come in and hear the technical discussion that's going on. No brochures, you know, no marketing wear, but get on the mailing list, talk to all of you, talk to the maintainers of all these projects, and figure out what the next big thing is going to be. Because history proves that that is where the future of technology is coming from. And that is what all of you, I hope, will participate in this week. So welcome to our event. I thank you for coming. We've got a great lineup for all of you this week.